me. All right, so if I am to blow up my sperm, or your sperm, as the case may be, why is it not working? Give me the plus. This one? Yeah, there you go. Ooh. Ooh. All right. That sperm is a little more than a, just that. It is... Okay? <laughs> There's really not much to this, but right in here, it actually has a couple mitochondria. So inside a sperm, it has a couple mitochondria. Why does it have a couple mitochondria? It needs the power to run the flagella. And every now and again, a mitochondria from a sperm will get into a mom's egg. So it gets into mom's egg, then what do you do? Kill it. No, we don't kill it. So one of the really interesting things about development is this egg, when it gets fertilized, right, that's one cell now. We have one cell, and it starts dividing. And when it starts dividing, it basically will divide in two, right? Doesn't, it divides in particular places, but for the purpose of this, let's just say it divides into two. What if that dad's mitochondria was here? Okay. Now only half of the cells have dad's mitochondria. These cells divide again. And so this happens, you get 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64 to 124, and I don't know, it goes not very many more than that um, before it starts. So all of this happens, and it doesn't change size. So that means you're, constantly, you're just getting smaller and smaller cells, right? Ding, ding. I could do this right until I had 128, but I can't do it, because really I can't do it. And so what happens is that dad's mitochondria might end up in a handful of cells. That's it. All right? So in general, we don't see dad's mitochondria in your cells. So when we do look at mitochondria, it's all your moms, except for that one rare circumstance. Okay? We're going to talk more about mitochondrial inheritance towards the end, but we're going to start with the whole energy metabolism. And you've seen this, right? You, you saw this in probably 106, probably 107. Uh, how about 360? Biochem. Biochem. 322. Right. I don't make you guys memorize all the intermediates and everything because you can memorize that in another class. But I like you to know what goes into a particular thing, like glycolysis, and what comes out and why. So if we look at glycolysis, right, the first step in this energy mechanism is, right, we convert glucose into pyruvate. Glucose. What's glucose? Sugar. sugar. Right? And how does a sugar get into a cell? No. <laughs> so there, Mo fell into the trap. He said endocytosis. If that were the case, where would glucose end up? Well, in an organelle, right? So it would go, if it's by endocytosis, it would necessarily have to be inside the lumen of an organelle. By phagocytosis. No, Michael. So where do things with phagocytosis go? Organelles. How? So, with gluts, right? We talked about gluts. What are gluts? Gluts are transporters, right? They're the glucose transporters, and there's glut one, two, three, four, and five. What's the problem with five? It's not glucose, it's fructose. Dumb <laughs> All right. So, all of your cells will have some glut transporters on them. What do you know about a transporter? So it allows something to go across the membrane. You were good right up until that point. With the gradient. With the gradient. So a transporter suggests that there's no energy involved. What's, what, what's the word I would 
would use if energy was needed. A pump. Okay, pumps require energy. Transporters and channels, they go with the gradient. Okay, with the gradient versus against the gradient. Pumps are against the gradient. And we're going to talk a lot about pumps very shortly. Okay, so glut one, two, three, and four allow for transport of glucose. So glut one through four allow for the transport of glucose into where? Cytosol. Cytosol. That's important because the enzymes that are required to break down glucose into a usable form are in the cytosol. So how did those enzymes get there? What? Don't say ER. There's soluble proteins that have. There's soluble <coughs> proteins that were made on a ribosome in the cytosol. No signal sequences. Got it? This should all be coming together. You're, the light bulb should be turning on. And you're saying, hey, I'm kind of getting this cell thing. All right? All right. So what does this mean? We say that glucose gets converted into pyruvate. Pyruvate, how many, how many sugars does a glucose have? Six. Six. So you're going to follow carbons in this reaction. That's what you need to do. Where do all the carbons go? So you start with a six carbon sugar, and you're going to make Three. ultimately ATP out of it, right? So pyruvate is how many? Three. This is a three-carbon molecule. Pyruvate is a three-carbon molecule. And the process of going from glucose to pyruvate makes two ATPs. Two. Okay. That's really shitty. That's not a good number. What, how, what can you do with two ATPs? Nothing. Okay. Two ATPs. All right. So you do one transport. Right, RAB is going to bind to GTP, which is the same as ATP. It uses energy. Okay, you're done, right? I mean, you use ATP everywhere. You're going to see every single molecule that we talk about. Okay, so glycolysis is a really shitty way to make ATP. It's not very good. Do any organisms live off of glycolysis alone, or can they live off of glycolysis alone? Yes? How many people think yes? How many people think no? So this half of the, most of this half doesn't want to vote. So the answer is yes. Some organisms can live off of glycolysis alone, for a while at least. Which organisms? Yeast. Yeast. Beer. Beer. <laughs> Bacteria. Right? How do they do it? They do fermentation. They make alcohol. Who doesn't like alcohol? Who doesn't like bread? Yeah. That whole process is fermentation. All right, so you're going to see that pyruvate is actually going to be taken out of the cytosol into the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, we make way more ATP than we make in the cytosol. What, what's the process called to do this? So it's not electron transport. It's not the Krebs cycle. Oxidative phosphorylation through chemiosmotic coupling. There. There's some science words. Blech. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll get that thing posted by tonight and the quiz posted by tomorrow so you have the whole weekend to work on the flip lecture and the quiz. And we'll come back and start here on whatever day is the next day here. Thursday. I don't want to see your package. I don't, I don't even like those parts. Just say no. So you're... You didn't allow me to send an email. I didn't, I didn't know. do it. It, it was oh, Darren. Darren. So he doesn't have your email? Okay, let's make sure he's...
get your email. You should probably have another one soon. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. It wasn't much of a meeting. It was mostly just, hey, what's going on? So, we'll do it again. Sorry. I didn't get it to go to a lot of... Am I talking loud enough? Always, yeah. <laughs> What? All right, so we were talking about energy metabolism, and what I want you to do, what I want you to do is I want you to be able to know what goes in and what goes out. This is, it's exactly what I'm teaching in 107. Exactly. It's no different. How many of you had me for 107? You're well ahead of the game if you have any recollection of what we did in 107. Okay, it tends to be that everybody just forgets it as soon as we're done. So... Where we left off, we were talking about uh, the concept of how do we get sugar into the cytosol, and what do we decide? Glut. 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 And Except for five. Except for five. What's glut five? Fructose. Fructose. Don't ask if you are. Mm -hmm. All right. What, what did we talk about specifically? Did we talk about glut four? Yes. What did yeah. we say? What's that? They're all transporters. <laughs> so they all, they're transporters, so they move glucose me, with the gradient, which means it doesn't require any energy. And where do we need that glucose to start? It needs to get to the cytosol, all right? These transporters, right, this is totally different than receptor-mediated endocytosis. Somebody asked me this, right? I don't know who it was, but what does receptor-mediated endocytosis do? Where does that go to? Into an endosome, into an organelle. Not helpful in this process because we need to get glucose into the cytosol. All right? What's going to happen to glucose in the cytosol? What's glucose good for? Glycolysis. It's carbons. It's got energy. Where's the energy? Stored in the bonds. Okay. How do they get there? How do those bonds get made? You look fabulous. Wow. You want to stand up and show everybody? This is like... Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wow. He dresses up good. <laughs> Edgar, you want to tell everybody? Um... What was the question? Uh, <laughs> oh, uh, how, did how, those, the how did those bonds get made in the first place? Um, not sure. How did the glucose bonds get made in the first place? Another cell put them together. Another cell put them together. What cell? Um, Plant cells. Chloroplasts. So in chloroplasts, right, what do chloroplasts do? We're going to talk about that next week, right? Chloroplasts harvest energy from the sun. the sun. They convert that energy into another form that is then used to generate the bonds of glucose. Right? Plants are good. Just go outside and grab a plant. Mm -hmm. That's sugar you're eating. There's a lot of sugar in there. Right? That's what they do all day, every day. Are you getting any protein out of plants? Plants have protein. It's not like your protein source because they don't have as much protein as meat. Right? How else can you get protein? Are there pl beans? <coughs> Aren't beans plants? You can get your whole diet from plants. How many of you do that? One, two. Vegan or vegetarian? Vegetarian. Vegan. Good for you. Okay. You're going to live long. Okay. I'm going to die shortly. Okay. The more meat, the better. Yum. Yeah. I'm going to die happy. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. So I'd like to walk through a little bit of this process and... I'll let you know what we need to know at each step so that we're all on the same page. All right. Uh, one thing I do want to point out on this slide, this is a lot of words. I hate words. Okay. Fatty acids, right, so fats, can get converted into ATP as well. 
And that process also occurs in the mitochondria. Okay. When they tell you you should be doing aerobic exercises, right? Aerobic activities. When you go for a run, you shouldn't be so out of breath that you can't talk. And that's because you want to continuously be breaking down glucose and fatty acids. If you're in anaerobic <coughs> respiration, right? You can't breathe. This is me walking up the steps. <laughs> it's, it's an anaerobic activity for me. What happens is you can't break down fatty acids at all. You can still break down some sugar, right? That's why if you're trying to lose weight, walking is a good place to start because you will be breaking down both glucose and fatty acids, all right? So fatty acids have to be in aerobic respiration. All right, here's the mitochondria. It is beautiful, is it not? Look at that picture. You can't get a better picture. I love this picture. What are we looking at? Okay, anybody? Can we label it? What's this? The outer membrane. What's this? Inner membrane, right? It's beautiful. We love these names. They're very difficult to remember. All right, now, what's this? white space here? The intermembrane. The intermembrane space. Okay. And what is this space? All of this. We call it matrix. So let's just actually open up a new one. Alright. So if we look at this, you've drawn this structure. You're never going to draw it like this, okay? We can't see what we're doing if we draw it like that. Um, this word, this chemiosmotic coupling, that shows up on every standardized exam. MCAT, GRE, everything. DAT, probably not a law school. It might show up in a law school. Who knows? <laughs> All right. If you break this word down, what does chemiosmotic mean? There, I gave you a hint. Chemi. Okay, osmotic. Let's just start with osmotic because if you don't know osmotic, that's it. Osmosis. What's osmosis? It's the movement of water from where to where? From the. Oh, I hear all sorts of things I don't like. From low solute. From an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. What's the purpose of that? To decrease the concentration where we have a lot of solute. All right? We don't like to have high concentrations of anything. All right? This is the, the movement of water. So part of chemiosmotic coupling you're going to see is movement of something from a low concentration to a high. And the chemi part, the chemi part is going to talk about a gradient, specifically... A gradient, there's a pH gradient, and there's also a gradient of charge. So we call it delta V for voltage, all right? And I'm going to talk to you about both of those and how they're generated. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. And, and you should draw this for yourself, right? So, so that you really understand these membranes, okay? So there's going to be an outer membrane. And maybe you want to use colors. It's like, it's like being in kindergarten, right? Now use your blue crayon. Okay, and remember how we draw this. We draw it so that it has lots of surface area. And why is surface area good? It's where the action happens. Okay, so the blue is called the inner membrane. All right, and the space outside, let's do purple for Courtney. Courtney loves purple, okay? So the purple is the intermembrane space. And all of these spaces are going to become important, okay? And I want you to understand is that by understanding this structure, it allows you to 
get some of the function. All right, and on the inside, the very inside, let's make it green. So in green, all right, so here, that is the matrix. All right, now, we know that it's important to have a lot of inner membrane. And I heard New Zealand say it. What is, what's the purpose of having all that inner membrane? There's enzymes embedded and there's channels, and there's pumps, and all sorts of things are embedded in that membrane. And you're going to know what those things are, all right? For the, for the moment, you can just make them be little, I don't know, they could be little pumps, they could be something like this. It doesn't really matter. But the more surface area we have here, the more ability we have to do that function that we're going to talk about. Okay, do we have proteins in the outer membrane, do you think? Absolutely. And one of the really interesting things about the mitochondria, where did we get mitochondria from? Bacteria. So these mitochondria actually are bacteria that were enveloped like by phagocytosis into a eukaryotic cell. So now we've taken in a bacteria. What's going to be on this outer membrane? Cell wall. Uh, that's a good guess. Cell wall, but it's not. There's going to be, no, there's no peptidoglycan. All of that is gone. What's actually in this cell, cell membrane, in this outer membrane, are proteins that look like bacterial proteins. And a lot of these are called porins. Have we seen the word porins before? Yes. In relationship to what? Yeah. Mm, close. The beta barrels. <coughs> so beta barrels show up a lot in the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Beta barrels. All right. What, <coughs> for those of us who need some refresher, what the hell are we talking about with the beta barrel? It's beta pleated sheets that are lined up one next to each other, and they actually make a barrel structure. And so what does that mean to you when you see a barrel in a membrane? What do you think that's going to do? It allows a lot of transport in and out. All right, so there's going to be tons of these. And what's really interesting about this is that... What does that, what's outside here? What's in this area? What is that? That's the cytosol. And so the cytosol <coughs> is almost, okay, we say that the intermembrane space is almost the same as the cytosol. Okay, and I'm going to say almost, all right, because it's not exactly the same. But a lot of things can move through these porins in and out so that it's almost the same. So you might ask, then, why do we have a membrane at all? Well, you can, why? why is, what, what kind of answer do I give you for why? It works. Can, we, can we answer that question? No, we can't answer that. It is, right? As biologists, we can see what there is. We can make up a story. I can make up a story for you. But we can't know why. It's working. It's apparently worked. So we've kept it. All right. So this structure is really going to help you. All right. Oh, look. There's what we drew. Sometimes it, I'm wondering if maybe I should just do away with slides and just do chalk talks. Because I think they're actually probably better. Although their drawings are way better than mine, right? So just remember that there's two different spaces, and we're going to talk about what's in the matrix compared to the intermembrane space. The porins that are on the outside that I was talking about, anything that's less than 5,000 Daltons can move freely in and out. Okay, and all of you, right in your head, right, your little calculator's going on, I know what's 5,000 Daltons. Or, Nobody knows what's 5,000 Daltons. I don't know what's 5,000 Daltons. But I can tell you that things like 
protons. So small molecules, really small molecules, some ions can freely move in and out. Can big proteins move in and out? No. All right? So, so if you think about this intermembrane space, it's basically going to be ionically like the cytosol. And that's going to matter when we start talking about this chemi-osmotic gradient. Okay? Ooh. So what is this? What is that molecule? If you just look up from your... From your a fat. Good. Why did you say fat? It's got two tails. So it's got a hydrocarbon tail. Courtney. Sorry. It's okay. How many chains did how many tails did you say it had? Two on each. <laughs> okay, that's a better answer. How many tails do you see total? Four. There's four tails. How many heads? Two. Two. One. <laughs> Look! It's all connected. Okay. Okay, so that's one head, four tails, right? It's like Medusa. We're multiplying heads, tails, whatever. So we have one head, but it has four tails. What do you think about a phospholipid that has four tails? What's different about that compared to one that only has two tails? Bigger. Who said that? Bigger matters. Size matters. Okay. Mo? Like it's non-polar end is stronger than it's polar end. Ooh, I like that. It's non-polar end is stronger, meaning what? Mm -hmm. more it's more hydrophobic. So what might you think about this as far as membrane structure? Thicker. It could be less It's a it's gonna make more interactions, right, in the membrane. So this actually <coughs> allows for a more structured membrane. This particular phospholipid is called cardiolipid. That's a clever name. Cardiolipid. Why is it called cardiolipid? Take a wild guess. It's found in the heart. Is it only found in the heart? Yes. Okay, you always go, so always go to scientists are so stupid? So the answer is no. Okay, what does it mean when we name it that? That's where they found it. Oh, so it must be in the heart. It's in all mitochondria. Cardiolipin is a phospholipid found in all mitochondria. But it was originally identified in heart tissue. I wonder about scientists, right? We're just not so good at anything. Um, and what's really interesting about this is this particular phospholipid helps to hold the enzymes in the inner membrane. So this is found in the inner membrane of the mitochondria, not in the outer membrane. So those, those enzymes that are part of the electron transport chain are held in place and part of that's because of this structure of cardiolipin. All right? I think that's good enough for that. We're going to talk more about the mitochondrial genome later, but what did we say about mitochondria genomes earlier? It's all from mom, right? All from mom. So it's maternal inheritance. Didn't I draw the picture of the egg? And the sperm? Yeah. All right. There are a handful of mitochondria in the sperm to power the flagella, but in general, they do not get into the egg cell. So that when fertilization happens, almost always, all of your mitochondria will come from mom. Why does that matter? Why do we care about this? Do mitochondria have DNA? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Why? It's from the bacteria, right? So we, as eukaryotes, took mitochondria into our cells, all right, and they had DNA in them, okay? If I were to take out a mitochondria out of a cell, could it grow on a plate? Could I make a bacteria out of that? No. Maybe no. How many people think yes? 
How many people think no? How many people don't care? Oh, man. <laughs> it's so disappointing when you guys just don't care. All right? You can't, OK? So over time, evolution has gotten rid of a lot of the genes that were in that DNA. And what do you think that DNA is good for anymore? Making, and so what it does is it makes some of the proteins that are part of the mitochondria. And it's really interesting, it makes some RNAs, RRNAs, what are R, hold on one second, Michael. What are RRNAs? Ribosomal RNAs. So I'm telling you that there's genetic material in this mitochondria and it makes some RRNAs. What is that going to do for me? They synthesize their own protein. They synthesize some of their own protein. Excellent. So there's going to be ribosomes inside a mitochondria. It's like its own little world. But it can't survive outside of a cell. It's lost the ability to have its own life. Michael? Do they grow and divide separate the cell? So Michael wants to know, do mitochondria grow and divide separate from the cell growing and dividing? So they... That's a good question. I don't know how often mitochondria are duplicated. I don't know the answer, but I perceive the answer is no. It has to do with the cell and the cell cycle. Um, can you have a cell without mitochondria? A eukaryotic cell without mitochondria? No. no. Right, so you need some mitochondria. and. This is, it's, Michael, you're like tapping into something that's really interesting to me right at the moment. My interest right at the moment is how organelles have evolved and then how organelles sort of are maintained in a cell. And I, I, don't, I don't know. I wish I knew. Sorry. There's so many things I don't know. Okay. So look at this. It has 13 proteins that it makes, 22 tRNAs. The hell are tRNAs? Transfer RNAs. What what does that mean? Hold on, Mo. Give everybody a chance. You're just too smart. Okay, go ahead, Mo. <laughs> it's, it's the um, it brings an amino acid to the ribosome while making protein. How? I, it's like has a structure where it holds on to an amino acid. When you say holds on, let's use biology lingo. Where it binds to an amino acid. It's covalently linked. And then it brings it, and then it has a anticodon right down here. Look at, so everybody turn around, look at Mo. So Mo is actually a tRNA right at the moment. Okay, wait. Can, can, I want, somebody take a picture of Mo. Anybody got their phone? I want a picture. This is, per, no? All right, we'll, re, we'll recapitulate this in the lab. So this is actually a beautiful thing. So he's showing that he's got an anti-codon region right here in the tRNA. So what is this? <laughs> what is this? What are we talking about, this structure? What is it? What is it made out of? Uh, RNA. RNA. This is a sequence of nucleotides, all right? And at the very top, up here, he's got bound to him an amino acid. <laughs> okay? That is the most beautiful thing I've seen. Thank you so much for playing the game. All right? He's like all red now. Okay? So, it's making 22 different tRNAs. All right? This isn't, this isn't really what I wanted to talk about today, but it's going to matter later when we talk about translation. Why do you need 22 different tRNAs? <coughs> How many amino acids do we have? 20. Why do you need 22 different tRNAs? I heard it. Donna. I am like an idiot savant today with names. Okay, Donna has it. There's 60 possible codons. 60 possible codons. How many? 
64. There's 64 codons, and three are stops. So we need 64 different tRNAs. That is beautiful. Okay. Wait, I have a question. Wait, Courtney, what is your question? So we have 64 possible codons. Why do we need 64 tRNAs when it says there's only 22? Oh, great question. So why are there only 22? No. So there's only, it's only making 22. Where the fuck are the rest of them coming from? Do we make them? Okay, so. Courtney is on a roll. We make them. And they actually have to get from our nucleus into the mitochondria. Okay? There's not just 13 proteins involved in the electron transport chain and other processes in the mitochondria. So we're actually, mitochondria are a combination of the DNA that's still there from bacteria mm -hmm. plus what we've made in our cell. Okay? Excellent. That was perfect, Courtney. All right. <sighs> blah, blah. All right, we're back to, so the part that nobody likes, the part... <coughs> where we start talking about the process. Okay, here's your favorite food. This is a cell. And here's a cell, and here's a mitochondria. Okay, they skipped having double membranes. They've just gone directly to having one membrane. Okay, you eat your favorite food. I used to put Pop-Tarts up there. I think when I was younger, Pop-Tarts were one of my favorite foods. Okay, then it became beer. <laughs> now, now I'm in the I don't know what my favorite food is. All right. Mostly every food. All right. Except, so we, for except for In N Out. It's not that I don't like In N Out, it's just I've never had In N Out. You should get it for your wedding. <laughs> <laughs> they do cater. They do cater. I am not doing In N Out for my wedding. Okay? We're trying to have a nice. We're trying to, you know, look nicer than we actually are. <laughs> right. So, so the food gets in, and you know how sugars get in. All right. So they get in through the gluts. Fats. How do fats get in? They just go in. Why? Because they can cross membranes. Oh. Oh. Right. Membranes. A lot of these fats can get in just by getting in. And in the cytosol, we do the first process, which is glycolysis. And in glycolysis, we already said, we start with the six. We're, we're not going to talk about fatty acid biochemistry. Is that okay? We're just going to do one. It'll be enough. Trust me. Okay. In biochemistry, you learn all of these. Okay. So we're going to start with sugar. The sugars can be broken down into glucose or converted from from uh, some other sugar into glucose. Six carbon compound, and it's made into, what's the molecule it's made into? Pyruvate. pyruvate. Yay, for pyruvate. Do you need to know the structure of pyruvate? No. 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 Mary Pat doesn't, doesn't care. Okay. Now, look at this. In the cytosol, Glucose is converted to pyruvate, and we get 2 ATP. Is that good or bad? Not that good. It's kind of piss poor. Yeah. Kind of piss poor. But in the matrix, we're going to do all sorts of fancy things, and that's where the majority of ATP gets made. All right? So we're going to talk about this as being glycolysis as number one, citric acid as two, we probably should talk about this as being 1A, all right? The conversion of pyruvate into acetyl-CoA. And then the electron transport is number three. We're actually, we're, you still don't have ATP at the end of the re respiratory transport chain. <coughs> There's one more thing after that. Okay, does anybody know what it is? The ATP synthase. All right. And... Now, I think, is now when we start going into nitty-gritty details. Oh, God. There's glycolysis. Isn't that painful? If you look at that, you're like, oh, what do I need to know? Do I need to know all that? What 
do I need to know? What okay. comes in and what goes out. Courtney, you are just amazing today. Okay, so here we go. Here's what comes in. And what they've done in this particular image is they've given you circles. Black circles are carbon. All right? Red circles is a phosphate. Okay? And they're showing you at each step what happens. In biochem, you have to know the name of every enzyme and every intermediate. Right? So this is glucose. And then this is glucose 1, no, this is glucose 6 phosphate. And then you go to glucose 1, 6 bis phosphate. And then it gets split into these phosphoglyceraldehyde. I don't want you to know all the names. I want you to understand what's going on. Six carbons. We add a phosphate. What's required to add a phosphate? An ATP. Wait, 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 wait. We're going to use ATP to make this? How's that useful? What are we trying to do here? We're trying to make ATP, but we're going to use ATP. How did this all happen? Magic. Magic. <laughs> Shit luck allowed for these enzymes to form and generate these intermediates that led to this process. It's unbelievable. Okay, if you can't look at this and say, I can't believe that this functions. This happens all day, every day, and you don't have to do anything. Right? So Nazila. There was a GTPase. Uh, it's not a GTPase. What's a GT? Oh, you're in trouble now. Did you really say that? You did. She's, she's one of the cutest things ever. She's like, all right. Did I have you in U100? Yes. Yes. She's like one of my babies. <laughs> I had her as a freshman. Can you imagine? How long have you been in this country? Uh, two years. So you had me right after you got here. Oh. <laughs> uh, that's probably not good, huh? Have you learned a lot? Like things that you probably never would have known at home? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she doesn't want to talk about it. So, I'm giving you some time. Now, why, did it, why am I unhappy with what you just said? Go say GTPase does this. What does a GTPase do? No! It turns on and turns off. No! It must be its name wrong, then. No. So GTPase is, name of GTPase. You got it. Dynamin. Donna is helping out. Dynamin. Dynamin is a GTPase. Is its role in life to break down GTP, Michael? No. What's its role? Dynamic, very good. That's Donna, you want to help him out? <laughs> to break vesicles off by changing their conformation when GTP is hydrolyzed. You want to name one now? <laughs> RABS. What do RABS do? They help transport vesicles from one place to another. Anybody else know another GTPs? Remember, RAB, RAC, RAS, RAM, RO, ARF, SAR, Dynamin. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> we can't just have, all right, that was your abs coaching snares. All right, so getting back to this. What allows for the addition of a phosphate? There's going to be an enzyme that allows for the addition of that phosphate. It's a kinase. We're not going to talk about that, right? So that's the, I don't care what the enzymes are, and I don't care what the intermediate names are. In biochem, you have to know every single one. So there's a glucose 6 kinase, something like that. That's not the right name. If I were to hit upon it, I would remember, but it was so long ago, I just don't care anymore. All right, so you have a glucose, and, but in the process, the kinase requires energy, and it uses the energy of ATP to put on this phosphate. So we've used energy, we've used one ATP, right, to make this, and then we do it again. So it puts another phosphate on, so now you have two phosphates on glucose, right? It's, I, I, I don't know why, because 
You ever, your mother ever say that to you? Yeah. Because I'm your mother. Because I said so. Because I said so. Oh my God. That's, that's taking me back. It's probably not good for me. So we've used two ATPs in the process so far, but how many ATPs did we say we were going to get out of this? Two. Two. So we used two, but we're going to end up with two. So what does that mean we need to do? Make four. We need to make four. And that happens here. We split this into two three-carbon molecules. Notice, all right, look at this. All of a sudden, we've gone from having one phosphate here. What happens here? We have two. We have two. Where did it come from? Where did it come from? Oh, my God. NAD. So NAD, what is NAD? No, don't, don't go there. NAD? When you say cofactor, what does that mean? Who said that? Nicole, was that you? Oh, Nicole, 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 Nicole. Where's my other Nicole? There's five of you. It's really not good. Okay. Crumpacker. Okay. Looper. Luhan? Fuentes. Fuentes. With an F? Okay. All right. I'm working on my idiot savantness over here. Okay, Crumpacker, what was it? What was the question? Um, I think you were saying what's the purpose of the NAD? What is NAD? What is it? I think it like provides energy. It helps the reaction. Okay, it doesn't provide energy. It's an electron carrier. That's, that's what you meant. On the exam, that's what I meant. It's not points. Tell me your name, sir. Enoch. Enoch. Enoch got it. It's an electron carrier. So you're close, though, Nicole, because you said something about energy. And Enoch, if it's an electron carrier, what does that mean? What, what is it doing? What, how does that have anything to do with energy? What does that have to do with energy? <laughs> Michael's just spouting off information over there. It's true, yet it doesn't really have any relevance to what we're talking about. So, if it's an electron carrier, Enoch, what, how is that related to energy? What do you know about electrons? Nothing? Okay, look about, how do electrons move? Right? And how can that be associated with energy? They're a form of kinetic energy. Okay? So we're going to grab some electrons from this reaction. All right, so you get NAD plus is converted into NADH. Do they show NADH here? At the bottom. At the bottom. Over here, same thing. So you get two NADHs, and so now those are carrying energy. Where did that energy come from? From the sun. Ultimately, yes, Amir. But where did it come in that reaction? From a bond. Okay, and what I want you to get from this is the whole process that we're doing is taking six carbon glucose, we're breaking it down into, ultimately, what are we breaking it down into? At the very end. Okay, not ATP. Acetyl CoA. No. So at the very end, you're going to end up with six CO2s, right? So you start with six carbon glucose, and at the very end, you're going to have six CO2s, right? So six, this is one six carbon, and you're going to end up with six CO2s. So the, you have to balance the equation here, all right? So we're breaking and making bonds, and what we're trying to do is grab out as much energy as we can from this process. Okay, here, right, you see some ADP is put in, and we actually can harvest some ATP. All right, so this side is the same as that side, all right, so we're basically doing this with two, this is pyruvate, and pyruvate gets converted, 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 converted. I'm sorry, this is not pyruvate. This gets converted down to a three-carbon molecule pyruvate.
So up here we added some energy, but down here we're now harvesting some energy. In, the con in ATP and ATP, so we get two ATPs on this side, two ATPs on that side. That's our four ATPs. <laughs> okay, so we were here, we're talking about at the end of this process, you have made four, four ATPs, but you also used two, so the net is two. You've got a three carbon pyruvate molecule, and you've got some NADH. Ultimately, we have to do something with that NADH. Why? So, so Mo's got it down here, right? We're talking about you're in a foreign country, and you have dollar bills. This is a bad example. Every country will take dollar bills. <laughs> you're in the United States, and you have pesos. <laughs> You need like seven billion pesos to buy a stick of gum, <laughs> right? All right? So in the cell, what's the only currency that can be used to drive these processes that we're talking about? ATP. So NADH isn't going to be good enough. Bonds, not going to be good enough. ATP, good enough. All right. This is the end of glycolysis. We haven't hardly done anything. This is a lot of work. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. For making hardly anything. Michael? Isn't there more energy in NADH than ATP? Is there more energy in NADH than ATP? You will learn that in just a minute. <laughs> so why can't the cell, Michael wants to know, why can't the cell use NADH? So let's talk about where do we use ATP? Where have you used ATP in this class so far? In a process that we've talked about. Anywhere? Uncoding. Uncoding. Do you remember what uncoding was? Uncoding of the code. Uncoding of the code, right? And nothing happens unless you take your coat off. Yeah. You leave your coat on, no fusion is happening. And why? Why is it ATP is required? Do you remember the other molecules that were required for uncoding? NSF. NSF? NSF. And accessory proteins, right? So the enzymes that are using energy can't use the NADH. It doesn't, what's an enzyme do? Now we're back in 107. It lowers the activation energy of a reaction by changing the conformation of the reactants. So part of the reactants in this is the energy. Right? If you have to put energy in, the only form of energy that fits into this enzyme reaction is the ATP, not NADH. Not FADH2 either. Okay, so enzymes... And, and really, you might get, this is how I think. So now Michael put that in my brain. Why? Right? Why? Why not? Why haven't we evolved to just use the NADH? Apparently, right, over, over the next billion years we might. Right? Shit luck may happen. You know, like, no? Really, really, like, very near impossible to change this up. Because if you change it a little bit, like, if you were to have a mutation in this pathway, you would just die. No, but we're not talking about changing this particular pathway. What we're talking about is having enough mutations occur to allow an enzyme to bind to NADH instead of ATP. That's what we're talking about. It would take a long time because they're totally different molecules. NADH is huge. That's prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Everybody. Everybody uses ATP. All living beings use ATP as their energy source. There are some prokaryotes that can use some other things that are not necessarily ATP, but they're very similar to ATP, okay, like GTP, okay? All right, are we good with this? Are you good with the, the glycolysis in the cytosol? Slide. Let's draw it. Let's, no, we're not going to draw this. <laughs> okay, so in glycolysis, okay, that you're going to upload this because this is free points, right? Show for me 
What happens when we go from glucose to pyruvate? And where we get energy. So what is the energy form that we have at the end of this part of glycolysis? What do we have? Think of Enoch when you write this down. Don't forget Enoch. This is Enoch. Enoch said something. Are you listening, Michael? Yeah. It's important to listen to your classmates. Help each other out. What are we talking about? So you've gone from glucose to pyruvate. And what did you end up with? Okay. You don't have to draw the cycle. I want to see where is the energy, okay, what energy have we harvested? What is it held in? What is the energy? Are you asking? Talk to your, talk to your, look, she's got it. You're doing great. <laughs> So how many carbons is in glucose and how many carbons is in pyruvate? Yeah, dates the other day. Uh, this will give help each other out for one more second. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. 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 Oh. You know, technology is also great right up until it doesn't work. All right. So, we haven't done much. We've gone from six carbon to three carbon. And the three carbon, whoops, the three carbon molecule 
is still in the cytosol. And we have to get it into the mitochondria. Okay? And there's, there's a complex that allows this to happen, and it's called pyruvate dehydrogenase. Ugh. What is pyruvate dehydrogenase? When something is a dehydrogenase, what is it going to do? Somebody want to say it so that I can hear it? Let me see a hand. Anybody? Everybody wants to say it, but they don't want to say it. <laughs> okay, it's going to take off a hydrogen. Dehydrogenase. It's not, not clever, people. Okay, so it's going to take off a hydrogen, but what comes with the hydrogen? So a hydrogen is what? Well, it's a proton plus an electron. So a, a dehydrogenase actually takes a proton and an electron off. So you're going to see the proton is going to get, what's going to happen to the proton? It's going to get released. And what's going to happen to the electron, Enoch? It's going to bind to a... That's your answer for today, you know. Yeah. Electron carrier. Sure, yeah. yeah, sure. <laughs> so it's going to bind to an electron carrier like NAD+. Excellent. I knew you had it. You're not going to forget it. No, never. All right. So this is the three-carbon pyruvate here. And we're going to actually convert it into a molecule called acetyl-CoA. And if you look down here, there's one, two carbons. So all we're doing here is going from a three carbon to a two carbon. So where does the extra carbon go? It comes off as carbon dioxide. Every one of the carbons of glucose is going to come out of the reaction as a carbon dioxide. Why is that good? Who's that good for? Plants. Plants. Plants love that. And what are plants going to put it back into? Glucose. There's a circle here. Glucose, carbon dioxide. Glucose, carbon dioxide. It goes round and around and around we go. All right. This is a complex reaction. I don't, what do I want you to know? What goes in, what comes out? So you got a three-carbon pyruvate goes in, out comes a two-carbon molecule called acetyl-CoA. All right. And one CO2. Very good. So one CO2 comes out. What else do we make, Enoch? Uh, we make some more NADH. We're, we're accumulating NADH. So now you have energy in NADH and acetyl-CoA. And these are adding up. This happens in the matrix. Okay? <laughs> So that means we have to get pyruvate all the way across the outer membrane and inner membrane. And the pyruvate dehydrogenase is actually, I think, bound to the inner membrane of the mitochondria and does this reaction. Okay? And so... Times two, because there's two pyruvates? Correct. All right? So everybody remembers we had two pyruvates, so we're going to have two of these as well. There you go. Is there energy in CO2? Yes, in the bonds. All right. Can energy be made? Bless you. Are you okay back there? Okay. So energy can't be made. It can only be transformed from one form to another. And in this case, right, we've, we've taken the three-carbon pyruvate, We've captured some energy in NADH that we can use. The carbon dioxide, right, is, still has some energy. And acetyl-CoA has some energy. Do you think there's any energy anywhere else? Is any energy given up in this reaction to another place? Yeah. Yes, where? Heat. All of these reactions give up energy as heat. All right. All right, you've made it past step one. Okay, that was step one. Now we're going to move to step two. Step two is the citric acid cycle, also known as? Uh, 
Krebs cycle and TCA cycle. TCA stands for <laughs> tricarboxylic acid. Tricarboxylic acid. All right. You're gonna like this because it's really easy to get this. I know when I was studying this, I was like, why is this so hard? It's not really hard. All right. So what I'd like you to know from this reaction, where is this happening? This is happening in the matrix. And what gets put into the reaction is what we just made. Okay, so here's our acetyl-CoA, two carbons. Okay, it's going to be added to a four-carbon molecule called oxaloacetate. Yes, I do want you to know that. I don't really necessarily care, but once again, this shows up on standardized exams. So it would just behoove you to, to kind of get it now. So if you're adding a four carbon to a two carbon, what do you get? Six carbon. Six carbon. Holy crap. <laughs> okay, we're going to make a six carbon molecule. Doesn't that seem redundant, redundant backwards, whatever you want to call it. Right? We went from a six carbon molecule to two three carbon molecules to two two carbon molecules, and now we're making another six carbon molecule. All right. This is citrate. Right? It is citric acid. It is tricarboxylic acid. That's where the name of this came from. Right? So citrate is the same as. So citrate is the same as citric acid, is the same as tricarboxylic acid. All of those came from the first product in the TCA cycle, in the Krebs cycle, in the citric acid cycle, is citrate. It's a six-carbon molecule. We're going to do, what do I call this? I think I call this chemistry masturbation. Right? Yes. You're going to take this molecule and you're going to... <coughs> play with it for a little bit, and you're going to, what's the purpose of this? For fun. For fun. <laughs> okay, well, if we're talking about masturbation, yes, okay. <laughs> but let me just say, chemists think that manipulating molecules, that's fun. Okay, how many of you in here are chemists? <laughs> Brian. <laughs> Figures. Okay. So we're going to take this molecule, this six-carbon citrate, and do some hmm, isomerizations. I can't even use the lingo. I'm not a chemist, and I don't care. All right. So we go from six carbons to five carbons to four carbons, to four carbons, to four carbons, to four carbons, to four carbons. Well, that just seems stupid, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, it's not. It's not stupid because in each of these manipulations, what we're doing is harvesting energy from that molecule. When we go from this six carbon, I don't even know what this is called. So this is an isomerization when you have a six carbon molecule here and it's isomerized into another six carbon molecule. I don't know what the name is. What is it? Isocitrate, maybe. Is it? So some people take biochem at the same time as this. It's usually, usually helpful. Okay, and then you go from this to a five carbon. Now you know. What did we lose? One carbon as CO2. Every single carbon comes out as CO2. All right? And then here's CO2, but what do we harvest every time we do this? Some energy in the form of an electron that's carried by NADH. You not got it. You said it even before I did. All right? Here's another one. Now we've got five carbons. We're going to four. Here's a CO2. You not? NADH. Four carbon. Another isomerization, look what we get. <laughs> GTP. Is GTP energy? Yes. Why? It's just like the atom bond. What's the bond? No, it's not a phosphate bond. It's a phosphoanhydride bond. And the reason I'm going to be particular about that is because phosphoanhydride bonds hold more energy than any other bond that we know of. That's not true that we use in the cell. 
It might be true. How's that? But every time I say all or none, somebody will come back and tell me you're wrong. I don't know. It's one of the highest energy bonds that we talk about in biology. How's that? So we're going to actually get some energy out of this step as GTP. We go from this poor carbon to this poor carbon. Look what we make. Holy crap. What's that? Yeah. What's FADH2? Another electron carrier. How does FA, so it starts out as FADH, right, and we add another hydrogen, but we're really adding electrons. Everywhere electrons go, protons follow. Somebody asked me, where do all the protons come from? Water. Water. We have a ton of protons in us. All day, every day, 70% water. Water is in equilibrium, right? It's OH minus and H plus. You have protons everywhere. There are protons floating around in the matrix, and all that's happening is we're getting an electron and a proton's following it. Oxidation or reduction, Michael? Reduction. Gur? Gain of an electron? Reduction. Reduction. Right? Do you all know Leo and Gur? Yeah. Loss of an electron, oxidation, gain of an electron, reduction. So this is being reduced. Four carbon, four carbon. Why do we have to do this little gymnastics thing back here? To remake oxaloacetate. Otherwise, this cycle will not be a cycle. It will be broken. I think we lost one here, right? This is what? I think that's an NADH. There it is. It's hiding over there. Oh. Do you know that when you, when, you make, when you make this smaller and it gets crooked, all you have to do is double tap on it and it straightens it out? Oh. Okay. It took me a long time to figure that out, okay? I'm sorry I didn't tell you earlier. I should have let you know. It is really irritating when you get it like this and you're like, God damn it, I can't take it. I like, right? So all you do is double tap on it. Dink. Oh my gosh, oh my goodness. Okay. We're learning together, people. I can't take it when it's crooked. All right. Uh, so what have we done here? What, what's left of our original glucose molecule? What's left after this TCA cycle? Just CO2, right? So two CO2s came out of this. What came in? How many carbons? Two. Two in the acetyl-CoA. Two came out. So now our glucose is gone. Voila. Okay, we've made GTP, NADH, FADH2. When you go to biochem, you're going to be way, way ahead of everybody. Okay? Yes, ma'am. We started with two acetyl so right. We have six NADH2, FADH2, and two, you know, multiply all those by two. Okay, I'm, I'm not following exactly. So, right here, from this one acetyl CoA, we made one NADH, two NADH, three NADH. Right. So that's three NADH, one FADH2, one GTP, and two CO2s. Yes, but did we start with two? So, Yes, we do. So this means that another one comes in. Another one comes in. So that means you end up with six NADH, two FADH2s, two GTPs, and four CO2s. And well, if we say, so four CO2s, but that doesn't add up. Because we lost the CO2 where? We lost the CO2 in the step before this. So in making pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, don't forget that we lost the CO2, but we gained a NADH, a friend. <laughs> we gained a friend in CO2. Okay. All right. Are you okay with this? I never ask for numbers. I don't ask. So in biochem, they ask for numbers. How many FADHs? How many NADHs? How many GTPs? How many this? How many this? Okay. The main thing I want you to get, 
Glycolysis gives you two ATPs. Everything else gives you a shitload of ATPs. You're going to see the number changes depending on what book you read. 30, 32, and 34. So the total ATPs from the whole thing can be either 34, 36, or 38, depending on what book you read. I don't even understand that. That's just dumb. All right? There we go. We make a little bit of GTP. GTP, Courtney, are you leaving me? I still have two minutes to blab at you. Do we ever leave early? No. Well, then what the fuck are you doing? Okay. <laughs> Did everybody need to know that? Yes. Yes, clearly. You got to go too, Stephanie? No? All right. So, NADH and FADH2, they are going to give up a little bit different amounts of energy because of their structures, okay? And you're going to see when we get to the next step in the electron transport chain, NADH will go to the first complex in the electron transport chain, whereas FADH2 doesn't start there. It starts a little bit after that. So who was saying earlier that you get more, how much energy, right? How much ATP do you get out of NADH? Michael started this conversation. It was a long time ago. Do you have any recollection of it? So you get... <laughs> From NADH, you get twice as much ATP as you do NADH. No? Did I, did I fuck that up? You get twice as many ATPs as you have NADH. No? No, NADH has twice the energy of ATP. Okay, well, Michael, you're absolutely wrong. All right? So, just one second, let me just finish this. So, NADH is carrying electrons, and as it gives up electrons, it's going to give up electrons, and then it's going to give up some more electrons, and it's going to give up some more electrons, and you make more ATPs than you have NADH. So there's actually more energy in NADH than one ATP's worth. Yeah. That's what I said three times. <laughs> it's, it's not what I said? Okay. I am not, I don't care how many. That's the beauty of this. Okay? So... Go listen to the lecture capture. I'm not going to listen to it. You can tell me next time. You were wrong. Okay, have a good weekend.